Namaste and welcome to another episode of Questioning Mind. This is a very special series where we focus on economics and I'm very pleased to have with me Karan Basin, who's uh, been uh, our guest on this channel a couple of times before. And together we're hoping to resolve a few questions around Indian economics. I can't think of a person better suited to these discussions than Karan, who has uh, a lot of economic papers and articles to his credit. He's a very well-known um, um, speaker, uh, but also an actual economist who works on poverty, whose uh, recent work on poverty gained quite a lot of traction actually, uh, but also um, has done a lot of statistical analysis of economies and how they work at scale. So Karan, thank you for making the time and very welcome, namaste. Um, and Hi, namaste. Thank, thank you for having me. The pleasure and having my All right, Karan. Uh, it's a very short round today, and uh, I hope we can do this a few times. So, to begin with, I know you've seen a lot of misinformation regarding Indian economics uh, in um, you know commentaries that pursue these subjects. Right? We've seen politicians, but also actual economists um, suggest things that might not be entirely suitable for the Indian economy. A lot of this, I have noticed, stems from comparative anal uh, analogies that do not always make sense uh, in the Indian context. I'm sure they are absolutely correct in certain scenarios, but when it comes to India, we cannot copy and paste a template that is suited to a different country. So uh, why do you think comparative analogies are so often used to make a sort of statement, but are essentially incorrect? I would say that somewhere I think uh, econ is hard, specifically when we venture into making policy advocacy. Uh, constructing coherent arguments uh, is difficult because, again, it has to rely on statistical empirical evidence. And more often than not, such evidence is, is, is not universal in the sense that when there are more data points, uh, an established empirical relationship might not hold true. Uh, this is the famous Lucas critique, uh, so to say. Now, when that happens, how do you convince people that what idea you're proposing is, is valid or it is relevant? The best argument that you can provide is a comparative assessment that, look, that economy did this, so you should also do this because when they did this, this happened. So you're comparing outcomes in two different uh, economies and then based on that you're giving your policy prescription and that basically becomes the fulcrum of your argument the problem where i see is that when you are comparing two economies that are not comparable that's where you get into all kinds of issues with such arguments uh if you think of if we think about it you know from the point of view of medical sciences and how they uh, how you know pharmaceutical drugs etc are evaluated you have a random trial where you have a control group and a treatment group and one of the key requirements is that the control and the treatment group should be very similar only then you can see the exact effect of the treatment being given when we look at economies there's just way too much that goes on so it's very difficult to first find a control and treatment group and similarly, it's equally difficult to find a treatment which affects only one economy in isolation. And this, to my mind, is the biggest reason why such comparative assessments are not, uh, not entirely true. I don't think they make any econometric or academic sense. Uh, at least most of the times they don't, because people generally in popular press do not, uh, you know, do not make a very clear case why a control error treatment group should be similar. A very recent example of this is the discussion on pump priming the economy, you know, fiscal spending and even monetary spending, so to say, during the pandemic, where people said that, look, advanced economies are doing so much, uh, they are going up to X percent of their GDP, so should India. And the same argument, I'm sure, was also being uh, uh, furthered in several emerging economies. And today, emerging economies that did follow that advice seem to be doing much worse than India is. In fact, India is not doing worse at all. It is surprisingly doing much better than most part of the world. Uh, so, so I think these comparisons are very good for rhetoric. They are very good at simplifying what you want to say. But as far as uh, as far as an argument or a case for a policy is concerned, I think a lot of them are. If if this is the if comparison is the only argument that they have, 
then I think that argument you know, is on a very shaky ground and should not be considered that seriously. Well, um, I think a lot of Indian policymakers, at least at this time, understand this, right? Their policies are definitely not framed on a temporized mechanism that depends on comparative assessment. So uh, when people do this sort of rhetoric generation, when they're writing articles, when they're making these videos, why, who do you think they're talking to? Who are their audiences? Because, uh, well, it's, it's definitely not something that policymakers are going to be looking at, right? I, okay, so I think here, you know, there's a slight nuance. There are certain places where we do have to look at what other countries are doing, like for instance, competitive taxation rates, tariff rates, etc. Yeah. Now, my problem is that a lot of these people who are making these suggestions mm -hmm. do not look at comparisons to see how competitive we are when it comes to taxation and other policies. But when it comes to fiscal spending, when it comes to spending on certain kinds of programs, that's where they do that comparative assessment. So it's very selective uh, mm -hmm. in terms of where the assessment is done. Now, it's very good that policymakers in India have historically been conservative and mm -hmm. post the 2008 experiment with fiscal uh, stimulus, they become even more conservative because they mm -hmm. saw the, the consequences of excessive prompt, you know, kind of fiscal uh, expenditures, pump priming, and then monetary easing. They've seen the consequences of it up until 2013 when the taper tantrum episode happened so yes you're right to a great extent i don't think that those people who are kind of making recommendations or who were making these recommendations were trying to give this advice to policy makers i think it was more to influence the perception so to say or to build a case for doing something which may not necessarily be the right policy uh, Hmm. But here also, I would give some benefit because, uh, you know, we have the benefit of a hindsight. So we can now say that they were wrong. Uh, but I, I, I think many of those people still do not think that they were wrong at that time. They, they still believe that the advice that they gave was right. And I think that's a bigger worry for me.